Well, yes. Yeah, so I am. I am excited. Let's uh, let's do this. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a special bonus edition of Pod Toy. I'm your host, Jim Sterling, Destructoid Reviews Editor. I'm joined by a very special guest. Uh, he's actually been on Pod Toyed before with my predecessor, Anthony Birch. Uh, I believe it was discussing art games, I think. It, I, believe it, I believe it was, yes. It was... Uh, I, don't know, I don't know if that... Um was the time after you had done your great, uh, you know, games are art uh, video, which I love. It's one of my favorite things. Um, I think it was because I was kind of like, <clears throat> I think he and I definitely were coming at things from a different different angle. Now, I think and, it was because I went on a big sort of attack on various art game attitudes, I, I believe shortly after. And I remember you seemed to be uh, punching the air at a few of the things that were being said. Oh. Hell yeah. I mean, I was, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, and it's, it's unfortunate and it's probably my poor communication skills mixed with people on the internet's desire to just, you know, paint and just hu humanity's desire to paint things in black and white. But, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed to art. I'm opposed to pretentious bullshit, you know, so if you can actually create art, I love it. But I was with you that most of it is uh, not all of it, but most of it's just a bunch of, you know, you know, masturbation. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of masturbation, just spent all this time talking about myself and not even introducing <laughs> the guest. Uh, I am, of course, speaking with David Jaffe, uh, co-founder of Eat Sleep Play, co-director of Twisted Metal, which released uh, just last week. No, this week. This is Tuesday. Yep. This Tuesday. Um, doing very well, I, I trust. It is, um, you know, I, I, we didn't know how it was going to do. And every day I keep, you know, calling marketing. It's like, ha have we, have we dropped? Have we dropped? You know, cause we, we came out of the gate with well above expectation numbers. And, uh, it's, it's really at this point about, can we hold enough to build a real strong community and can we get our network bullshit worked out with Sony? Um, but yeah, I mean, the sales are really, really good. And, um, you know, as I've said to people, you know, it's, it's, it's a, you know, the, the single player is, is solid. Um, we're proud of it, but it really is about the multiplayer and people seem to be really digging that. So we're, we're quite excited. Excellent. Now the multiplayer is gated behind an online pass which yes. is the reason we're chatting because both David and myself, uh, we are, I'd say we're both very outspoken on the subject of used sales and online passes and, and everything else, correct? And everything else. Yes. Um, especially well, on the sort of, we should, if there's time on this or down the road, we should have that conversation about the pros and cons of being so fucking outspoken because I, I just, you know, I was at, I was at the Dice Awards the other night. I don't want a tangent, but I have to share this because I, you may or may not appreciate it, but I think if anybody would, you would. Um, and I was watching all of these, you know, these really just talented, really just genuinely good people, Todd Howard and, and, and uh, 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 Ted Price and just all these really well-loved uh, developers in the industry and also just sort of, you know, in the media. And I was sitting there going, you know, I'm I, I'm so divisive, and I on one hand I really hate that because it would be so nice to be so well loved, but it's kind of like I struggle with that because on one hand it's like, do you have to, you know, can you really be out there and, and honest and still be that, or is the only way to really be beloved by people or beloved by people to pretty much not? To, it's not that you don't have an opinion. Those guys are way smarter than me. But is it is it this like you know what it's like politics and religion? You just don't talk about a lot of shit except just your work, and no one will have a reason to dislike you. I mean, do you find that in your industry that other journalists are like, dude, shut the fuck up, or what? It's uh, it's an even split, I think, and I think you get that with any anyone who reaches a sufficient level where they're known by you know a decent amount of people. I think you're always going to get an even split between people that like them and people that don't. And, and yeah, it's true with game journalists. Uh, well, I hesitate to use that term. I find that incredibly fucking pretentious. Yeah, um, but the, you're, you're, the way you go about things, you have to be more divisive than, say, um, you know, Jeff Keighley, who I think is, is very, um, you know, he, he, seem, he doesn't really go out of his way to, to sort of, you know, twist the knife if he has issues. I mean, he'll be honest, but, and I'm not saying that's, a, I, that's one of the things I love about you, but I mean, I have to assume that, that you have more haters and lovers and you're, you're, you have more passion on both sides than someone like Jeff Keighley, right? 
I think the hatred is... I would say Jeff Keighley probably has more fans and more haters just per capita because he's, he's a lot more well-known than I am. I think the hatred I get is probably a bit more personal. Uh, oh. There are people, especially on sites like Reddit and N4G, you just say the word destructoid and you're guaranteed about five comments saying, oh, I hate that Jim Sterling guy, man. Um, and that's like the first thing they bring up. And there are, there are whole blogs devoted to myself. There are some people... There's one blog somewhere that has my name on Google Alerts, so if I say anything they can construe as sexist, they'll get to blog about it. Uh, so, yeah, it's weird. I think there's a strange obsession that some people have with... I did not know you had gotten hit with the sexist hammer as well. I got hit with the misogynist and sexist hammer a couple weeks ago, and I was... I, I was really offended by that. I was really taken aback by that. It pissed me off, man. <laughs> I, di I did notice, yeah. Um, I used to get pissed off at that. I just kind of ignore it now because some people are always going to be angry and they, they need sort of villains to be angry at. And yeah. I guess if you're noteworthy enough to be someone's villain, then, you know, I I'm grateful for the opportunity to be that important yeah. to somebody. No, uh, that's a good point. That's a very good point, yeah. actually. Um, I mean, plus, of course, I mean, you know, the, the whole feminist issue is a very naughty one. And there there are many sensible, calm, rational feminists. I'm married to one, for instance. Right. Um, I don't say that, that sounds bad. Like, I'm just trotting. Or, Look at my pet feminist, you see? I'm not a sexist. <laughs> right, right, uh, right. I went, out, I, I went out and got me one of them. Yeah. <laughs> but there are, you know, rational people and irrational people in, in all sectors and... I just try to let the irrational ones just do their thing and get it out of their system. And and in a way, you're bringing joy to them because they enjoy being angry. So you're helping yeah. everyone, healing the world. Very nice. Very nice. That's a good way to look at it. All right. Well, let's uh, let's jump on to the, the reason we're here, yeah? Absolutely. Uh, I think long-time listeners and, and readers of Destructoid and Podhood already know my stance. Well, anyone who ever sees me anywhere knows my stance because everywhere I've ever gone, I've trumpeted my very staunch opposition to online passes. I did a recent video series on the Escapist, um, the Jimquisition. I did a mini-series on online passes and how I think they're bad for the industry at large, not just consumers. Uh, but more to the point, they are very anti-consumer and not just used consumer. Um, but David, I mean, y you're in a unique position, and this is why I really wanted to talk to you, because you come across as very pro-consumer in, in a lot of attitudes you have, while at the same time still being very sympathetic toward the business side of the industry as a developer yourself and as someone who works with Sony and, and what have you. So you seem to, I think you've got a, a, a more unique perspective than myself or a straight publisher, but you know, I'm looking out very strongly for consumers. They're looking out very strongly for themselves, and you're you're kind of a middle ground, I think, if, if that's fair of me to say. Um, um, well, you know, not really. I, I think, I mean, I think I am, you know, I, I'm definitely pro consumer, but I'm all, you know, but I am also, you know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm pro, you know, the, it's like a triangle is the way I've been describing it to some people when we've talked about it in the press. Is that you know, I I, I look at you know, for a while, especially with GameStop, because they're the biggest seller, at least in America, I think worldwide, but certainly in America, um, you know, for a while, I all I knew them was as GameStop, and I knew my local GameStop, and they were, they, they were, they're really good people there. But I was like, oh, big corporation. But, you know, I did this thing in Vegas with the, with the GameStop company, uh, where I would, you know, go out on stage and talk to their managers and assistant managers, and I got to meet them afterwards, um, after the presentation and you know what i found was that they were you know i can't speak to sort of their big corporate heads i've never met them but the individuals who work in the store i was really pleasantly surprised that they're gamers they're hardcore i'm not saying all of them but the ones that came out to vegas that i met and there were thousands of them um they love games they 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 really take their job seriously about you know putting the right games in the right hands of people when you find a really good manager assistant manager so from that i really became you know, pro all points of the triangle. I, I see it from all sides. And I think the problem, you know, uh, you know, you and I have sort of framed this as a debate slash discussion. And I definitely want to, I want to talk about where we disagree and see if there can be, you know, a changing of one of our minds. I'm open-minded to it, but I definitely look at that relationship between retailers and publishers and developers, which I'll just group into one place and consumers and say, it's, it's a real, 
it's it's real unhealthy right now, and everybody's got good points on all sides. And um, but ultimately, you have to be pro consumer. A because everybody begins as a consumer. I began as a kid with very little money, and I know what it's like to you know, to go in. And the worst experience I had as a kid was going into service merchandise. And I bought this Atari 2600 game called Slot Racers that had the coolest fucking cover in the world on it. It looked like you were going to get get to live in a game that was a cross between Tron and Star Wars. And it ended up just being utter shit, you know. And I, I think they gave us shit for wanting to take it back. And so I, I everybody comes at it and if you lose your consumer perspective, you're dead and you should never lose it because I'm a big believer in the free market and I'm a big believer in the customer unless you're being a dick is, is always right. Um, but yeah, I see it. I see it from all sides and I think it's a really unhealthy, toxic relationship right now. And it's, it's, it's a problem. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely an, an animosity. I think I said the other day, uh, that I, when it comes to gamers, especially the hardcore ones, I don't think I've met, a legion of fans and supporters as doggedly loyal as gamers, especially when you start talking about the different fanboy sects and the various religious holy wars you have between the Xbox fans and the PS3 fans and what have you. You see an immense amount of loyalty and an immense amount of excuses as well. I mean, my job is to criticise a lot of games, and it seems the job of many gamers is to justify all of those criticisms I have um, on their side and, and stick up for... For, I mean, recently I, I talked about Ubisoft selling uh, Dungeon Hunter on the PS Vita for $40, even though it's a port of a 99-cent map game. And I found that rather gross, but there are still gamers willing to back you know, back Ubisoft up on that and, and support them. Uh, well, i got to ask you, because I, I was going... I, I, I w I've been really enjoying my Vita, um, and I was on their store today, and I saw that game, and I have that game on my iPad... Um, and I was like, well, I'm not going to buy that. I'm going to wait for the one that – I forget where they've changed the title that used to be called Ruin um, from Sony, which is kind of a similar game that looks a lot better. And I was like, you're, you're, that's, they're selling that for $40? Yeah, I mean that's the thing. And, and there are gamers that will be okay with that. In fact, Dungeon Hunter is um, – I was told last night by one uh, GameStop manager that it's been pre-ordered more than Luminous. And – well, just, I can understand that just because of the subject matter. I mean, you know, but mm -hmm. but forty dollars for that game is uh, not that I'm knocking the game. I enjoyed it on my iPad, but I don't know how much I paid. It wasn't ninety nine cents, but it was definitely under five dollars. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, that's the thing. It's forty dollars. It's forty times more expensive than it should be. People are buying it though, and and that's what really throws me about publisher attitudes today. Is gamers are that loyal and that willing to basically allow themselves to be swindled and yet we're being treated increasingly like thieves whether it's drm or online passes we're constantly being asked to prove ourselves prove our loyalty validate ourselves with the publisher on their end and say oh you know i was definitely a loyal little consumer please give me half of my game now please and that's what really infuriates me because i don't think there's a, a fan base as loyal as gamers out there uh, no matter how many buy used, there are still so many that are, are willing to, to pay and justify and excuse publishers anything. And yet, no matter what side of the fence you are, the attitude from a publisher is, you're a stinking thief. Okay, well, let me, let me just respond to a couple things. The first thing just, that, that came to mind when you were talking, and that they're, they're related, but you covered a lot there, and I, I definitely want to respond. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the first one is... Um, when you talk about the loyalty, that's a real tough thing, at least for me, on the side of, um, you know, on the publisher or the developer side. And I'll give you an example of things that I've seen the last couple of days. Is, is anybody who's sort of followed my Twitter feed or, you know, who, who's who's interested in the new Twisted Metal, you know, we we've struggled because you know Sony has admitted they're they're dealing with some server issues and we're going to get it taken care of very soon and it's getting better, blah blah blah. But I've had people go onto my Twitter and say, you know, I'm going out and buying Twisted Metal because I support David Jaffe. And I'm like, as much as I appreciate that personally, I, you know, that loyalty can, you know, I, I don't want them to do that. I want them to go out and buy Twisted Metal. Uh, I want them to rent Twisted Metal maybe with the hope of buying it because they genuinely like the game or they're interested in it or they've read a review that says, hey, this connects with me. And so I agree with you that sometimes I think that loyalty uh, – can can is not always you know i think consumers you know i want consumers to love the games i've worked with teams to create because they love those games not because they love 
you know, or they're interested in what I have to say personally. That's sort of a different thing. So I'm with you on that. I, I wish they would be more um, uh, discriminating and, 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 and but, it, you know, it, it kind of balances out. Right. So if you go into Metacritic, you, you know, for Twisted right now on the user score, you'll see tons of tens. And out of those tens, there's got to be a large percentage that we didn't really earn those tens. They're they're doing the fanboy thing. Some of them we earned and we're grateful for. But on the flip side, you see a lot of ones and twos because they're they're like fuck Jaffe or fuck Sony or fuck Twisted Metal, you know. And so maybe all that balances out. But I, I do I definitely think you ha- you're onto something when you talk about sort of the loyalty uh, that keeps individuals from sort of making a pure genuine decision but you you know look man it happens on the it happens on the press side as well you'll see a real hype game and it'll get like a nine or a ten from the press and then six months a year later everybody's like well that's not really a nine or a ten that's more like a seven but the press was so caught up in the hype or whatever uh that you know so there and i don't know if that's games only i mean it seems that sports fans have a real similar kind of um passion that sometimes gets in the way of being able to genuinely judge the experience. But I, I definitely, I definitely hear you and I definitely have noticed it and I, I I'd love it to be pure only because, you know, look, if, if we get great reviews, I want them to be genuine. I, I don't, I don't want to ride on the backs of, you know, past victories or my personality for better or for worse. So that I wanted to respond to that. Um, when you're talking about, um, and then the Ubisoft thing real quick, because it's like on one hand, I hear you on the $40 game. I agree that's bizarre and not necessarily nice. But they're also the company that, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled they're putting out games like Rayman Origins and they're selling that for 30 bucks on the Vita, which I think is one of the best games of the year. So, you know, there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes with these companies where, you know, you, you, know, you, you, you have to kind of do this thing that you might look at as a negative thing in order to sort of support these more artistic or more, you know, uh, interesting titles that, that may not have as big of a market. So I don't fucking know, dude. I think it's, uh, I think it's, I think that's nuts, but okay. So to the point though, uh, are we debating online passes only or use games too? Uh, we can do both. Well, cause I'm, I, cause it's almost like the, 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 it sounds like, um, and I've purposefully stayed away from some of the things you've put up as of recent because I knew we were going to be having this conversation and I didn't want to kind of have any prep. I just wanted to respond purely. Um, but it sounds like the biggest thing, is it fair to say, that you have with the online pass is just it being a pain in the ass for the customer. And so because of that, there's a feeling of why are you punishing your actual paying customers? I wouldn't say that's the biggest thing. I mean, that's definitely a big part of it is just this combative nature that... I mean, not even just game publishers, but all companies uh, tend to have with their consumers when they should be working together. Um, that's definitely part of it. The other part is that I do strongly support the used market as a concept, and I believe it is beneficial overall to the industry, more so than people would like to admit. And when I see direct attacks on the used market, I see corp- um, various companies and publishers Looking at the short-term gains and not really thinking of the long-term impact, uh, because I do think the used market is... I think if the used market disappeared overnight, if publishers got their wish, GameStop all shut down, they could only sell new games or whatever, I think that would have a direct and very damaging long-term impact on the market, unless publishers would be willing to uh, lower their prices or change their business models, which I think many prehistoric old companies have proven over the years they're very unwilling to do until forced at the last second so i you know as much as i hate online passes just for what they are currently i also hate things that directly attack the used market okay so uh, yeah all right so i i if, if we talk the like, something that yeah the bigger i mean the bigger issue and i i don't have any i'm not you know privy to any specific logic although you know, it, ha- it stands to reason that the reason online passes, and it's not just from Sony, but you've seen it with EA, you've seen varying attempts from Microsoft with like Gears of War, where it's not an online pass, but it's like motivating you to buy new. Um, I have to imagine that the reason those things have become more popular, not in terms of with consumer, but in terms of publishers, is because they're trying to combat the used market. So, you know, I definitely want to touch on online passes, but yeah, the bigger issue uh, is the used market. And, and, and I can tell you, um, you know, it's, it's weird because I do, I do think it, I, how do I put this? I, I see a lot of sides of it. Right. And so I definitely think the concept, 
in my mind, what the publisher should be listening to um, is the consumer behavior that motivates so many people to buy used. Now, there's there's no doubt that you know everybody should be um, chasing after the best deal that they can get as a consumer, right? So let me give you an example. So even myself, right? I've been getting uh, I've been collecting a paycheck since I was in college, and I'm 40 now. And this will be the first week because even though I've left Eat Sleep Play, uh, I won't leave it until March. Um, you know, we're I'm not being paid anymore by Eat Sleep Play, and I, you know, I'm you know, no one needs to worry about me or anything. I'm fine. You know, my family's fine. But just because I grew up without any money, the minute I was like, holy shit, I don't have, I don't get a paycheck anymore, and until I get my new company off the ground, I don't expect to. I've absolutely kind of switched back into the kind of person I was when, when I was living with my family and having no money. So I'm like, well, fuck, I need to sign up for Gamefly. And I totally, yeah, if I can get a used copy, I'm going to buy a used copy because I'm in save money mode. I'm in kind of gather the nuts for the winter because I don't know if it's going to take me two months or eight months to set up a new company. So I've always been pro-consumer in terms of get the best deal that you can get. And so it's not that I'm opposed to the used market from a consumer standpoint. It's the fact that um, I don't think that um, it, 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 the used market has absolutely um, been detrimental to business success on the publisher developer side. And I totally get and I agree with the view that says um, – you know, the used market basically drives a percentage of the new market because somebody will turn in three games. And I've seen it on my Twitter. Someone's like, dude, I'm trying to find five games to trade in so I can get Twisted Metal, you know, or whatever. I, I totally get it. Um, I also get the fact that I literally walked in yesterday to buy Twisted Metal because Sony hasn't sent me my copies. And I'm standing at the fucking counter and on the GameStop TV above me, it's like trade in, you know, Twisted Metal and for $30 in store credit. I'm like, dude, it just came out, you know. So um, I, 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 I see it from all these different sides. And the idea, though, that I am not convinced on is that the argument that says the new game business is driven by used game sales, which I agree with, I don't know how much of a percentage that drives new game sales compared to the percentage of games that are not sold or the, the publisher doesn't get paid because of used game sales. So I would agree, but I, it feels to me on the publisher developer side that the vast majority of the hurt comes from us not selling copies not from the fact that, oh, hey, look, some people buy new games because of the used game market. So I, I think both of those things are true, but I think the damage is, is substantially more than the benefit, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, I see what you're saying. Um, I mean, obviously, it's very hard because there are literally no numbers for any yeah. of this. It's all gut feeling rhetoric. It's people arguing from personal experience. The so, only people, the only people that have the numbers I would imagine is are, are the retailers and maybe, you know, maybe the, the, the thread to follow is why don't they share them? I mean, they do share, they do share the fact that what they make in used game sales, a percentage of their, of their profit is from used game sales, but they don't tell you, Hey, this is how many uh, twisted metals we sold used. And maybe they just don't track it. Or maybe there's a reason they don't want those numbers to come out. Yeah, I mean, that is true. Um, the only other sort of real concern that I have with that is, I mean, we, we talk about how detrimental used games are and how companies are losing millions. And then in totally separate stories and, and, and other sort of bits of information, we start hearing how profitable the game industry is, how it's more profitable, profitable than other entertainment mediums. Everything's doing well. So we're being told out of two different corners of the mouth that companies are all at risk thanks to used sales and companies are still doing fantastically uh, I, don't, I don't know if that's true though i think i think you i think it's very it doesn't take a lot to separate those two messages i think you can look at something like halo or you can look at something like modern warfare 3 and go okay yeah you, you know there's the big write-up in the major you know in time and usa today and all the big mainstream papers oh this this product did more than any other entertainment product in in, in the first day or whatever but th those are the absolute rare exceptions and i don't think you know i don't remember when uh you know uh com other companies are coming out there and saying hey you know we did great with you know uh uh most of our games i don't i don't i don't I don't think that that's really 
uh, the case. I mean, think about that. I mean, that's the other thing is it's like, you know, think, a lot of people say, because I, th I think where you're going or I see online a lot where there's this sense of greed. The, 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 the consumer is like, oh, the publishers are just fucking greedy. They're fucking greedy. And these are the same people who think I live in a house in Malibu, like on the beach, because I worked on God of War and Twisted Metal. And I assure you, I do not. You know, I still pay a mortgage. Like I said, I'm fucking saving nuts for the fucking winter, right? Um, so that's not the case. But um, ask yourself this. If, if, you know, it's pretty dumb business when you think about it. To, 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 to do online passes. Because if you think about just the relationship with the retailers, a publisher is basically saying, we sell our hardware in your store, you sell our games, you advertise our games, um, we are willing to basically really damage that relationship with you guys by cutting off the thing that you're most profitable with or, or trying to squeeze that. We're going to basically take your used game market and we're going to put these passes in our games that we know gamers would prefer are not in there. Now, why, why if it was just greed, if we were all making so much money, would publishers and developers risk what you guys seem to think is a cash cow and in, 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 in hurt that relationship with the, with the people that are selling our products. I mean, don't you think that the very act that we've done it should signal at least a little bit of faith that we're not sitting here rolling in money and we just want more of it? I don't know. I mean, wh why would ACDC refuse to put their music on iTunes uh, on the basis they don't feel they're getting enough money for it, even though iTunes is very popular and they would sell a lot of uh, digital copies that don't require being packaged and, and distributed. Um, well, why it do you sounds think like a... I think that is. I, I don't, I, I don't, I'm curious because, I mean, Kid Rock does it too, and I'm like, well, I don't know why anybody would choose not to sell with iTunes. Well, exactly. I mean, it, it, it's, it would seem like a better deal to make your music more accessible and easier to get and thus encourage people to buy it. And that can be transposed on to publishers. I mean, you say it, they must have a good reason for doing it, but I don't think I've got the same faith in publishers because I, I, I don't think they've demonstrated that they've got that knowledge, that they are in touch with consumers enough to think that what they're doing is potentially dangerous to themselves. No, 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 but I'm not even saying that. I, 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 don't, I think you're right and you're wrong. It depends on the publisher. But forget, forget the consumer for a moment. I'm just saying the publisher... Because, you know, if you're viewing the publisher as just this greedy money machine that doesn't care about the customer, and yes, there are some of those, and there are some that are not that at all. Um, but if you're viewing it that way, you have to assume they have a pretty good connection to the retailers because that's where they get the money from. And I'm not saying why would they risk pissing off the customer. I would agree in some cases some of the publishers could give a shit if you've got to enter a little code. They could give a shit. Not all of them, and I wouldn't work with ones that don't give a shit because I, I'm, I'm a, that's one of the reasons I've always been a big Apple fan, although then I'm hearing about how they make their products and I'm rethinking it. But up until that, I love companies that put the customer first and say, this is a, this is a service and, 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 and our job is to make you get, feel that you've gotten way more value for your dollar. I'm saying, though, that the publishers have a direct connection. The lifeline is that retail connection right now. Why would they risk pissing those guys off? If we're making so much money, why would we run the risk of hurting that 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 cash flow and that 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 cash cow by suddenly trying to disrupt their used game market? If it wasn't really something that was hurting game companies' ability to stay in business and profit, why would we do that? It's a good question. Um, the only thing I would say is GameStop hasn't been pissed off as far as I can tell. They're still selling these games. Um, some of them have even, you know, made little sly deals with like Warner Brothers to sell the online passes themselves. Um, Which I, I never understood that. I, I, I have become a fan of GameStop after my Vegas experience in terms of as a company, but I never get it's like we're come into our store and buy it buy something that will let you go home and get it digitally. I'm like, why? I can, why do I need to buy that? The whole point is it's fucking digital. But anyway, yes, yeah, they have made some deals. Yeah, so I, I mean, EA was the first company to really introduce the online pass thing. And EA strikes me as a company that does not like risks. It does not like to gamble. If it takes a new IP, it's going to make sure that it's a new IP that is guaranteed to do what they want it to do. If they're going to come up with a new business idea, they want something that works. I do not believe EA took on the online pass thing without at least 
working out what the risk was and assessing the risk wasn't that great. That there was a huge amount to gain with the least amount of effort, because that's what an online pass is. It's gaining money while putting in the bare minimum of effort to try and force the consumer to buy new, rather than going to any actual lengths to make the the sale more attractive. They just take stuff away, which takes no effort at all. Um, So I, again, like I say, this is all, it it can only ever be speculation and rhetoric because no one's ever going to tell us. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I'll just say, I don't believe that EA sat there and thought, well, we've got to do something. We're going to put all our cards on the table and make some great big gamble. I don't think it was a gamble at all. Either they sorted something out with GameStop beforehand, or they just, they they don't factor in GameStop's potential to rage, and, and they don't take it that seriously. I Again, I, I, I'd have to assume, you mean the gamers rage or GameStop's rage? GameStop's rage. I mean, as evidenced by the fact that GameStop doesn't seem to have a problem with online passes at all. Something something tells me EA had already accounted for that because EA is a company that accounts for things. I think it's a very interesting relationship. I mean, on one hand, you've got um, a, a, a huge retailer that, you know, if, if suddenly they said, you know, I mean, look, they've, they you've even seen some stores, I think, in... Uh, I think it's the UK. There was just a story somewhere that's like, oh, well, we're not going to carry the Vita. I don't know why. It's a really cool system, but we're not going to carry the Vita or whatever. I mean, you know, you 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 lose GameStop right now, and it becomes a real hard hard road to hoe. And I think, um, you know, I don't I don't think publishers have any interest in alienating those folks. And when they put out their you know quarterlies and they say this is our percentage of used games that that make up our profit, it's it's it's. It's if it's not over fifty percent, it's like forty eight percent. I want to say it's over fifty percent. So I can't imagine any publishers like, oh, GameStop's not going to give a shit about this. So whether they've made some deals behind the scenes, I don't know. But look, that's what I've always been pushing for anyway. I've always been like, dude, let you know. I mean, again, the, the customer, and this gets into the whole, you know, uh, customer rights thing. And, and my whole thing, I've always been like, you know. And I say it this way intentionally for a couple of reasons where I say it's not the customer's business. And what I mean by that is the customer should only be concerned about getting the best game at the best price. And he should not give a shit about what happens or she should not give a shit about what happens behind the scenes because every business has that. Every business has, you know, hey, you know, you you do this, I'll do this. You, You buy three ads for this game and I'll give you this, you know, exclusive, whatever. I mean, that's just the way business works, you know. So the customer should just be looking for the best deal and the best game that they can get. But I've always been like, yeah, man, if, if, if GameStop, my ideal situation until digital distribution takes over um, is, is that they say, yeah, look, you know, we'll, we'll only sell this game new uh, for, you know, six weeks or two months or, you know, whatever. And then it becomes available to rent. Then it becomes available, you know, for used. And we'll give, you know, the publisher a percentage of that. Now, again, they don't have to. I'm not saying that should be a law. A lot of people get mad at me because they're suddenly like going, well, this is the legal. It's like, yeah, dude, no one's saying that they have to do it. But I'm saying, you know, movie studios don't have to agree with um, AMC and Lowe's and all the different uh, 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 distributors, what are they called? The the people who own the movie theaters, the, uh, 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 the, whatever, the the movie men. (laughs) Yeah, they (laughs) They don't have to agree with the theater owners like with Tower Heist that Warner Brothers was like, hey, we're going to put this on video demand. And the theaters were like, well, fuck you. If you do that, then we're not going to do this because you're going to you're cutting off our ability to make money on the first run and our concessions. There's no law that says Warner Brothers had to do what the the theater exhibitors wanted. But they're like, oh, well, okay, well, we don't want to do that. So let's backpedal this. So I'm not I'm not debating about the legality of it. I'm saying that if if GameStop and publishers want to play nice and, and hopefully make more money and still treat the customer right. I'd love for them to say, okay, you guys get rid of your use passes or your online passes. And in exchange, we will hold, we won't push used game sales and we won't even sell games used for the first two weeks. We won't push it on customers for four weeks, you know, um, and, you know, if, if we sell X number of units used, we'll cut you in at a percentage if you do this for us. You know, it would just be nice if there was a bit more of a you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours that you see. And there may be that happening under the table. But I don't know. I don't know how that works. I mean, I certainly haven't heard uh, about those sort of, uh, you know, uh, dealings. But yeah. um, I mean, this is the thing, though, that that does work both ways, because I've I've spoken to a few GameStop managers and, and other sort of retail store workers. And I was pretty much told that when they sell a new game, 
the profit the the actual retailer makes is in the single digits. Oh yeah, absolutely, and I've heard that too. And, and, and they, I, and I again, I'm not privy to their figures, but I've heard the same thing, which is, you know, our our profit on these games, unless we sell used, is terrible. And so look, and if they can't stay in business with us because that, then maybe that's something on the publisher side that they need to go. Okay, let's let's make you guys feel more vested and more like a partner. And you know, it's I absolutely think yeah, that that's yeah. shitty. But that's what makes me so furious about this whole thing because, as far as I can tell. GameStar, Game, even Best Buy now, HMV, all this, all these companies have all been pushing the used sales a lot more in the past few years. They've been having to rely on them. And as far as I can tell, it's because they just don't make enough money selling new stuff. So what you're looking at the used market as it exists today is a problem that was caused by publishers. But, Yet they're know, using GameStop as a villain, as a scapegoat. And the consumer at the bottom of the, of the of the pile is the one getting fucked by everyone thanks to this. Thanks well, to the public that, okay, that can be traced back. I don't know if I agree with that because let, I mean, there's two things you're saying that I'm not I'm not entirely with. The first one is this idea that the consumer is getting fucked. Um, okay, you know, does it suck for the consumer if he's bought a game with a used pass uh, and it's a used game to have to go in and enter some numbers? Yeah, it does. But you know what? It also sucks that I have to lock my door at night. It sucks that if you're in college, you have to lock your bike up versus just leaving it out. I'm not comparing used game consumers to thieves at all. I know some people have said that. But the reality is we do live in a world where, you know, if, if you just leave it up to, you know, the majority of people to quote unquote do the right thing, um, you know, and that's subjective, you know, they're not they're not always going to do that. And so, yeah, it sucks. You have to fucking enter some some numbers. But you know what? You also can go out and and play through, um, you know, I was at a focus test and I was asking the guys, what's the last game you played? He said, oh, Resistance. And I said, oh, where did you buy it from? He says, oh, I didn't buy it. I got it from Redbox for a dollar. And I ended up playing through the entire single player campaign for two dollars and I took it back. And so the guys who made the game didn't see a dime except off that single copy that was probably rented, you know, from that Redbox, I don't know, 300 times over the course of its life. Um, and you know, their work was enjoyed for a couple of dollars and I'm not saying that's bad for the customer. I think that's great. The customer got that experience, but to say that they're the shit into the pile, I don't know. I would, if I would agree with that. Um, and the other thing I would say that you just comment on what you just said is this idea that it strikes me as interesting that, that, that people can be so quick to vilify the publisher but not vilify the retailer. Now, I'm not saying either one of them are villains, but this idea that, oh, the poor retailer, they're not, they're only making a couple of dollars in profit and it's that evil publisher, but it's in that you can take in and, and, and entertain, but you can't take in and entertain the other version, which is, oh, the poor publisher developer that spends, you know, 20 to 70, $80 million on a game and they're losing a large percentage of sales because people are not, not people, but retailers are able to sell that game after buying it once over and over and over and over. And I'm curious why it's so easy to put the, the villain hat on the publisher but not the retailer for you. Um, I am not saying GameStop isn't evil. or Well, I mean evil is a stronger word. I'm not saying GameStop isn't run by dicks. It is. Um, publishers are generally CEOs are dicks. No matter what industry you're in, I think that a lot's been happening in the political sphere to more or less demonstrate that. Um, I am not championing GameStop. I don't like GameStop. That's something I think people sort of don't realize. I'm not a big fan of GameStop. I'm not a big fan of most retailers. And in fact, I've been withdrawing a lot of support, like looking more into Netflix, become a, a big embracer of Steam, what have you. Um, I yeah, don't I, think I love, that... I love Steam. Love Steam. Go yeah. ahead, sir. Um, GameStop, it's not so much like I'm defending GameStop, it's more like you've got the publisher, which is a dick. You've got GameStop, which is a dick. And it's not so much about one being a poor me victim, it's about one of those dicks having the power to stop the other dick doing something dickish. And the publisher has the power to not make these companies embrace used games so much by cutting them a better deal on new games. I'm not saying poor GameStop. I'm more saying the publishers could have stopped GameStop from doing what it did, or at least 
reward, you know, made gave them more of an incentive to not push Jews games so hard. They could have stopped do this. You, do way you? Back do you? Let me tell you. I, I've been harping on the used game sale issue for a long time before online passes came about. Do you honestly think that this was like the very first? Um, I don't know. Not to be you know dramatic, but. It, you know, it's a fun it's a fun way to say it. But I mean, do you honestly think this was the very first shot fired? I mean, you don't think that the publishers have had reached out to their retail partners and said, "Hey, can we can we can we swing a deal? Can we do this? Can we do that?" You think that just one day somebody woke up and there was an online pass and GameStop was just caught totally blindsided by it? No, no, no. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is, um, why are these used games being pushed so hard? Just, just why do they have to do it? And I think you and I already agreed that it's because they're not making enough money with new sales. Well, if that's okay. the case, why haven't the publishers already fixed that problem? Well, here's that's a problem we know. That's right. Here's what we do. Well, here's what we don't know. In the same way we don't know, uh, meaning we, you and I, and the average person, we don't know how much of the used game... We, we don't know if the percentage of new sales that are driven by used games, which we know there is a percentage... We don't know if that's substantially big enough to make up for the lost sales from publishers. We also don't know um, how – we don't know if the 2 3 $8 profit margin that the retailer sees on a new game uh, is, is, is that – we also don't know if that's the driving force behind their passion for used games or if they're the guys that that your a lot of your readers accuse publishers of being, they're sort of swimming in their piles of money, and they just want more and more and more. And it's easy when you're not in that boat to say, oh, you know, both sides have a have a have a a line that says, oh, poor us, and they also have a line where someone can look at them and vilify them and say, oh, you're just a greedy bastard. And I don't think either one of us really knows. Yeah. Which is true. The only thing we really know is we are seeing continued, if I'm correct, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure GameStop remains a real profitable company every quarter continuing to, to go up. And I think we're seeing lots and lots and lots and lots of video game publishers and developers going out of business. So we do have that as sort of a, uh, uh, as sort of a, a reading of the tea leaves. But you know what, though? Ultimately... All this, and I don't even just mean because digital distribution is going to make this sort of a, 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 a moot point. Ultimately, though, there's a, there's a bigger issue here. This is this is kind of um, th th this is this is temporary, and this is this is tied to the day that we're living in because of technology and the way the retail market's been set up. But I think the message that we need to really be hearing that the issue that on the people who make game sides and retailers, frankly, need to be hearing is what consumers are really saying is they're not happy. They think games are too expensive. They don't think they're they're most of them, not all of them, but they don't they don't think most of them are worth the cost that they pay. Um, and they show us that every time they buy a used game. They show us that every time they buy a ninety nine cent game. They show us that every time a brilliant game like Rayman Origins. Uh, doesn't sell um, at the price point it launches at. Um, you know, it, it, it's what we really need to be hearing is um, maybe because of the way the market, you know, and, and games in general have been sold for the longest time, and now that's changing. We just kind of got not complacent, but we just assumed this is the value of what we make. And I think, if anything, this is a good time to really reevaluate that and go, okay, look, do I think sixty dollars is too much to pay for Modern Warfare Three? No, I don't. I think it's it's it, you should pay more. Now, I'm not saying you should sell the disc for one hundred and twenty dollars, but if you're a fan of Modern Warfare Three, and there are many, um, the idea, and I'm not talking about the single player, I'm talking about the multiplayer. The idea that you you you've gotten well more than sixty dollars worth of entertainment from that purchase. Um, whereas, you know, if somebody, like I've said, I said this in the press and a lot of people shit on me for it, you know, but if you buy twisted metal just for the single player, um, whether you, Jim, I know you didn't care for it, but whether you, you're one of the reviewers that did or you didn't, but let's assume even if you did care for it, I don't think it's worth $60. I think if you buy it because the local and online multiplayer, it's worth more than $60 if you like that kind of a game. And so I think that's the bigger thing that I don't think a lot of us are hearing because we're so stuck in the the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And it's like, you know what? The sky fucking needs to fall because games cost too much and they're, they cost too much to make. Not all of them, 
Um, but they, but a lot of them cost too much to make and they cost too much to sell. And that's really the, the message I think. And that's probably why customers are so pissed off. Yeah. And they're really, and that's the thing, like the problems are there to see for anyone who wants to look at them. As you say, I think the message is that customers are pissed off and it's not just the cost thing, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, the point is there are so many better ways to tackle used games than online passes, than straightforward, just slapping the consumer, like putting all of the burden on the consumer, like punishing a used consumer and okay, making a new consumer. Give me an example of how to tackle used games in a way that's fair to everyone. Do you have one? Uh, first of all, I mean, what you were saying, build on that. I've pushed for flexible pricing structures for a very long time. Um, I don't believe that every game should come out at $60, and that's the uniform price. Uh, Namco Bandai had no fucking business selling Enslaved Journey to the West for $60. That was never going to sell. That was ridiculous. The game is brilliant. The game is fantastic. But it's not worth $60 because the market didn't decide it was worth $60, and I think its failure at market proved that. Um, meanwhile, we get something like Deadly Premonition, which came out at 20 bucks, and even on Amazon went down in price beyond that, and that sold really well for them, uh, and, and has been a huge success for Swery 65 because it was priced flexibly. Um, that's a big problem with publishers. They are so stoic. Um, a lot of major corporations you'll find are like this. The record uh, labels in the 90s uh, were like this, and, and that didn't go well for them. Um, they w will not change. They do not like to change because that's how they do business. And if you don't want to do business with them on their terms, you're fucked. And that needs to change. We need flexible prices. We need... Well, okay, and you're, I, I, I've, always, I've always thought the same, but I, I, when I've brought this up to people who kind of work in sales and stuff, and, and this, is, this is interesting to me because um, it, it's easy to say, and I, think, I don't think you're wrong, although I think it's challenging because think about this. I mean, what their excuse is is always, well, look, the, the, the top of the line games are $60 right now. If you come out any price under that, you're going to be seen as a budget title. And it's like, well, you know, a lot of that has to do with sort of retraining the way the consumer thinks in terms of marketing to the consumer in a different way. But, you know, think about it, man. Think about, you know, you've got people online who get vicious because a game that they like or don't like gets, you know, this gets an 8.6 and this instead got an 8.9. It's like, who gives a shit the difference between a 0.6 and a 0.9? So if you've got gamers who are that, you know, you know, you know, passionate over, you know, what, three tenths of a point or whatever it is. I'm not a math guy. I think it's three tenths of a point. Um, what the fuck are they going to do when suddenly they see Rayman Origins for $9.99 or ten or $19.99? They're going to they're going to make a judgment call. And I think I do think there is something about that mindset that is key, that, that whether or not it can be retrained out of the gamer and the consumer or not is a different issue. I think it can. But I do, I do, I do, I see where the sales guys are coming from because look at how the audience responds to a, a slightly, you know, deviation on a review. How are they going to respond to a nine dollar title? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the consumer can can be retrained. I, I'd say look at iTunes for that, where a ninety nine cent game is just as capable of being a major success as something like Infinity Blade, which comes out for five ninety nine, or Chaos Rings, which Square Enix put out for, I think it was like 17 bucks. They put that out as an iTunes game, and people bought it because, well, because they, they loved the look of the game, and, and they trusted Square Enix as a publisher. Um, I think the flexible pricing structure of iTunes is a really good thing to look at, and, and I think that, that proves that gamers and consumers in general are capable of, of flexible thought. Um, I think the other major problem we have is we get these uh, big name games and the developers making them, uh, I, I believe Todd Howard said this with Skyrim, and they always say $60 is too much. They always say that. And then they follow it up by saying, but ours isn't. Ours is fine. And well, that's okay. never going to change if, if it, well, we need a developer or a, rather a publisher with the balls to take the first step. I and put out a quality game for twenty bucks. Okay, but let me let me respond to that uh, because first off, I don't think there there's the cynical side, and it's a, and it's a valid it's a valid cynicism because there's there's truth that 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 births the cynicism, which is yes, if you've got someone who's out there saying, but ours isn't, yeah, there's a lot of people who will just feed you a bunch of bullshit. But at the same time, though, 
Yep, you know, just like nobody sets out to, to write a bad review or write a bad novel or make a bad movie, no one sets out to make a shitty game. And so if you are actually putting a microphone in the face of, of a developer, of course they're going to think theirs is worth it. But, I mean, you know, they're, they can't really be trusted, can we? Because we're in love with these things. If we weren't, we wouldn't give our lives to make them. And so do I – look, I'll say the same thing. I mean, I, I got shit for saying it, but no. Twisted Metal single player, as good as it is, as bad as it is, not worth 60 bucks. And it's not worth 60 bucks if you don't like this kind of an online shooter or local shooter. But if you like this kind of game, it's worth more than 60 bucks. And I don't know if that's, I can tell you now, Jim, I mean, that's not a line. That's not me trying to pimp the game by the time this thing airs. You know, you know how it goes. The game makes most of its sales in the first four or five days. You know, it, it is what it is, you know. But um, I definitely think if someone's out there pimping a game, look, I mean, I can tell you my, I had three games of the year. Uh, Skyrim, Batman, and Rayman Origins. I think Skyrim was well worth sixty dollars. I think uh, Batman uh, was worth sixty dollars, although it, it it would have been nice if it was forty. Um, I think Rayman was in no way worth sixty dollars, and it was one of my favorite games of the year in my top three. Um, and, and and that's not me dissing Rayman. That's me going. Does not work. In fact, I'm playing my Vita the other day. And I wanted to buy Rayman, but I'm like, it's 35 bucks. I'm not going to spend 35 bucks on that. But one of the best games of the year. Um, and and I, so I, I, I agree with you, but I, I, don't, I don't necessarily think that the developers, when they say, but ours is, I don't think that's a lie. I think, I think they think that. I think you want them to think that. Otherwise, they're not very good developers if they're not in love with their game. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that is true. But you get something like Skyrim. Now, that's unquestionable. No one questioned that that would be a Game of the Year contender, and not only that, but a huge seller. I mean, that was going to make money, regardless. Now, if they'd have put that out on the market for $40, I think that would have been amazing. I think that would have sent a message that games don't have to be $60, and they can still be amazing experiences, because that was never in question. I don't think anyone would have looked at Skyrim and thought, eh, it's only $40, it's probably shit, I'm not going to buy it. It still would have made a ton of money, possibly, you know, who knows how much more it could have sold at that price. You know, that's something we'll never know. And that would have sent a message that cheaper doesn't automatically mean worse. But, of course, yeah. Bethesda's not going to take that step. And, and, I mean, I guess they're not morally obliged to, but... Well, they don't have to. I mean, ultimately, there is also, you know, I mean, if you look at what, it, what was it, 2K did a couple years back when they launched their football game against Madden at 19 bucks. Um, I know that did really well for them, I believe. But and you know, uh, the guys at Valve have released the figures on you know dropping price and it shoots stuff up. But I mean, take you know, Skyrim's kind of interesting because if you've got a great game, it's not bad business to say, look, you know, especially when it becomes digital. Part of the problem is a price drop these days is is driven by a lot of things um, that doesn't always benefit the publisher. But if you're doing a digital thing like Skyrim, um, I'm not saying it's only digital, but let's just assume it was digital, and you come out at a hundred bucks. And it's like, you know what, we're going to get as many $100 people as we can. And then we're going to drop to 60 and then we're going to drop to 40 And eventually, you know, the publisher is still making that money. They're still getting paid for their work. But you are able to sort of have these, you know, uh, you know uh, different life cycles of these products, I think, is, is wonderful. But um, I, I think the other thing to keep in mind, too, is is the budgets of the games. And this is this is the real tricky part. And this is going to be... You know, people talk a lot about Apple coming in and disrupting, and I think they have in a lot of ways. But I think one of the ways that hasn't entirely become super clear yet and isn't talked about as much yet is um, it's kind of like cable television. You know, for a while, you know, I grew up in the 70s and in, 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 in 80s. And so, you know, you had three major networks and that was it. And so when the, it was the final episode of MASH or every Thursday, my mom and dad and brother and me would get in my parents' bed and we'd watch the Cosby show and we'd watch Family Ties. And you would see like, you know, you know, a third of Americans, because that's sort of what I saw the, the, uh, the, the Nielsen's for in the paper, were doing the same thing. But it wasn't, it wasn't, even though I love the Cosby show and I love Family Ties and I still love Family Ties to this day, it wasn't that those shows were so amazing that they were worth that viewership. It was that there weren't a lot of other options. And so suddenly cable TV comes around and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It's kind of like the internet now. And now you, you no longer see that unless you're talking about some huge event and even numbers on the Oscars and the Super Bowl have gone down. 
I know Oscars have. I, I think the Super Bowl has been steady, but um, y- you know, you've you've seen a substantial fragmentation because the audience is being served in a lot of different ways. And so I think I know this is a long-winded way of saying it. And I apologize, but this, you know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, making this shit up as I go in terms of I haven't had a need to articulate it before. So I appreciate the opportunity to, yeah, to no. with you and your audience. Um, but what's interesting about it is is game developers and publishers have really been um, concretized in their thinking about what a game is worth, and that's what drives our budgeting a game. And so the concept of having to sell everything at $60, um, part of it comes from that. But I think what's going to be really interesting about the iPhone is that there is a casual group of gamers out there, but I also think it's the hardcore guys as well who are saying to us as creators, we don't need every game to look like Uncharted 3. You know, we don't need every game to have all the features of a modern warfare. We're okay with that. Uh, if it doesn't, but price it accordingly or, and, and or, it should be and or, um, make sure that what you do provide is equally compelling uh, but just in a different area. And I think that's been part of the problem is that it's it's been, oh, well, we're making a game. It's for next gen. It's got to be this cost. And I think, you know, digital distribution is, is helping with that when you have something like Journey, which clearly its art style does not demand the same budget of a game like, you know, Uncharted 3. Um, but that's been a real, and it will remain. It will, you know, I, I'm just rambling. Edit this because I'm rambling. But there's 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 gold in these hills, I swear. Um, because well, the other thing I'm thinking about is I've been talking to people about this when I've been going up about my new studio and what I want to make. And I talk a lot about, um, doing a big next gen game, but I also am really interested in the browser space and what a lot of people make a mistake when they're trying to make browser games for gamers is they basically try to make a game that competes with the console games. And you really have to look at it like a movie television model. Nobody makes a, a weekly episode of, uh, you know, at the time lost or whatever the big, the big one hour drama is these, I guess it's all breaking bad and and whatnot. They're saying, look, we're not going to compete with Michael Bay making transformers Four. you know, let's figure out a way to provide, you know, let's differentiate television and let's, let's create our content that will be compelling, equally compelling, if not more so, but in a different way, but to, to play to our budgets and to how people consume our stuff. And this is where it gets to me really fascinating and probably maybe way too geeky, uh, but I love this stuff, is this is where when I stand up on stage at DICE a couple of weeks ago and talking about stories or you relying too much on filmic language, we have, we have become such an industry in a lot of ways where we've given up a lot of us on or we've, we've kind of pushed aside the essence that makes our industry so amazing, which is interactivity in exchange for production value. And so now you come to a point where it's like, you know, now we're the business is demanding of us. If we want to be able to stay in business, we have to find a way to create the perfect 999 game, the perfect 1299 game, whatever these varying structures. But all we've been conditioned to do, a lot of us is go, well, a good game and look, reviewers have been complicit in this and well, as well, a good game is about the production value, the graphics, the cinematics, the music, the voice acting. And suddenly it's like, oh, well, we can't compete with that at 1299 price point. We're fucked. And it's like, yeah, because we've we've kind of we haven't evolved play mechanics. We haven't evolved the actual medium anywhere near as much. And honestly, reviewers haven't trumpeted that is much. They're given nines and tens to great production value that are basically special effects reels. It's almost like the reverse of movies where if, if Michael Bay made video games like he makes movies, he would be he would be getting an interactive achievement award every year. Yeah. Oh, no, I totally agree. As someone who um, tries to review games a lot more on their specific entertainment value and what they do rather than what they look like, I would totally agree with that. Uh, while coolly sidestepping myself away from that criticism personally. Um, But no, I mean, I can't disagree with with anything you said there. But again, I think that all of that burden is on the industry side. It's on the industry's shoulders to create, to innovate. Uh, And and that's something that something like an online pass just isn't going to solve. I mean, that's not going to solve anything. the online pass is going away because the kind of this kind of distribution is going away. But for, if we're if we're just talking about the time being, I have you seen figures? I know a lot of people say Resistance Three, and I haven't. I haven't played a lot of it, but I enjoyed what I've played. 
a lot of people attribute, and I don't know if this is just bullshit, you know, vocal minority or it's true. They attribute the lack of Resistance 3 success to the fact that it had an online pass. Do you think that's true? Um, I know that Resistance 3 is so far the only game I've reviewed where the online pass factored into the score. Because I don't actually agree with factoring an online pass into a review score unless it directly impacts the gameplay or my enjoyment of the products uh, outside of, you know, just putting in a, a code to get to it. Resistance 3's online pass was put in so fucking badly that I wouldn't be surprised if some people had heard about it and not wanted to buy it. Um, what, what, I, I, I haven't been online with it. I've just been playing hmm. the single player. What is it, what, why is it so poorly implemented? Um, just to give you my sort of experience with it, uh, and I realize my experience isn't going to be completely uniform, um, but it took me 40 minutes to stop playing my single player and get into the uh, m multiplayer. And that wasn't just because of res Resistance 3 itself, but also just the way the PS3 is set up. Uh, because in order to get to Resistance 3's multiplayer, I was playing the single player. I beat the single player. I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to hop into multi now. Couldn't do it. Uh, you can't, on Resistance 3 at least, you cannot in uh, input the online pass within the game menu. I had to exit back out to the PS3's XMB, then navigate over to the PS Store, and when I went to open the PS Store, firmware update. So I had to sit there and update the PS3's firmware, uh, which uh, took, I dread yeah. to think how long it took, um, then go into the PS Store, go up to the redeem option, fiddle around with the fucking code, which annoys me anyway, close up the PS Store, go back, reopen Resistance 3, and then go and play the multiplayer. And that is not on. That is not acceptable. No, it's not. Let me tell you this, and I, I'm only going to say this because, you know, anybody listening to this, look, I mean, I, I have an Xbox. I'm looking at it right now. I, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of games. I'm a fan of Steam. I'm not like, I'm not, you know, it, it's it's not all Sony all the time around here, although I, I love my Sony products. But I will tell you that, and the only reason I'm saying this is because I think they are evolving in a good way because I wouldn't want to, you know, I wouldn't want to insult my friends and I know they're hard workers in, in all the departments of Sony. But that Onion piece where, you know, that, that, that got viral and it was great about, you know, Sony's new launch product, you saw that, right? It rings a bell. It's basically, it was, it was a TV ad. It's like, Sony Today launches their new this, that, you know, it's like, and everybody's been like, Oh, that new stupid piece of shit or something. Yeah, like, it's like, yeah. I don't fucking know how to work it. I'm just some asshole. You know, I mean, th there, there is truth to that, but it's got, I do think it's getting better. But again, I'm not saying this, like, go buy Sony if you, if that, if you value that. There, there's definitely been, and maybe it's, maybe it's a Japanese uh, thing where a lot of the direct directives, I, I don't know why, but I definitely... You know, I was playing the Vita recently, and again, I've had a, I've been surprised by how much I've enjoyed playing with the Vita. And a lot of it is just the user experience. It's still a little confusing in some. It's like, wait a minute, I, I how do I navigate this? But but that aside, I think I mean everything from the fact that there's fucking background music on the goddamn you know desktop. You know, I, I hope I, I hope you can change it. I'm kind of getting tired of it. it. Feels like I'm getting a massage, but it's still if there's a sense of like, hey, you know what? From 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 the beginning to the end. There, there's a sense that they're picking up on the fact that the user experience is important, and I would agree with you. What you just described with the resistance is 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 shit in terms of not the game by any means, but that experience. And I think, um, you know, that's another big not it's not even a challenge, but it's something that people who make games really need to kind of get get right on. Is people are like Jaffe, why do you want to do browser games? Well, there's I'm not saying I only want to, and I might want to make a big next gen game, but one of the many reasons that browser action games appeal to me is 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 the low barrier of entry. And when you have so much competition now for your free time, sometimes I'll sit down and say, "Oh, I want to I want to play Skyrim." Like, uh, you know, I got to boot it up. I may have to do an install. Then I got to go through the goddamn XMB or the dashboard doing their fucking little logo and all this shit. And then I got to go through the legal menu. It's like, no, you know what? Let me. What's over here? And I'm on to the next thing. And what I love about, I've loved it since the, the DS and the Vita, and I, I started the PSP, and I love that it's on the Vita, is, you know, I'm actually playing more of Resistance Golden Abyss, and I enjoyed uh, Uncharted, not Resistance, Uncharted Golden Abyss, then I played the last Uncharted, simply because it's like, oh, hey, I got to go take a poop, boom, I'm playing Resistance. Yeah. You just yeah. turn it on, and you're back where you left off. And I know that that would seem like a minor thing. Like, if you're a hardcore guy, it's like, dude, if you fucking really love games, it's like, you know what? I do love games, but I also love my kids. I love, 
you know, making sure I have stamps to pay my fucking mortgage every month. You know, I love making sure that I do rarely, but more often than never get to the gym to get my fat ass on a fucking exercise bike. And it's like, if, if there's, if there's, you know, a barrier of entry and I've got a million other things to do, I'm going to make other choices. And I think that's a really, you know, I think, I think that's a big part of, uh, where I think the next gen consoles need to go. They need to always be on this boot up shit. It's got to go, man. Yeah. And, and I think really, I mean, you've almost said what I was going to save as my big knockout punch against online passes. Um, and you're also part of the solution when you, you say you're moving on to look into making browser games more co- and more convenient, streamlined experiences. That's how you win in entertainment. That's always been how you win in entertainment. Piracy, for example, only thrives for as long as a company comes along and does what they do better. Uh, we've seen this with iTunes, where piracy for music has, has gone down, while iTunes provides a better service than piracy, because I'd have to you know, boot up LimeWire, search for a name, um, have to differentiate between what they've mislabeled as Phil Collins and what they've mislabeled as Genesis, uh, because I want to get just Phil Collins. And... Whereas I, on iTunes, type in I Phil hope, Collins, I, there you I, go. There's not, I hope there's not a mocking of the Phil Collins in there. No, 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 no. It's it's a mocking of people that can't tell the fucking difference between Genesis and Phil Collins. Well, look, get it well, right. So, well, now yeah, that's you know, no, I'm and all these people. Oh well, you know, Peter Gabriel Genesis is good, but Phil, no, fuck you, Phil Collins Genesis is fucking good too. Hey, Phil Collins, hey, look, they were better separate. I love Peter Gabriel's solo stuff, and I love it's, Phil Collins' Lair Genesis. I agree. I agree. Um, but, but more to the point, <laughs> I mean. Paper Late's a great fucking song, and Illegal Alien's a great fucking song. It's fucking people just against Phil Collins. You know what somebody said to me the other day? They watched that Shoot My Truck video. They said, Jaffe, you look like an angry Phil Collins. <laughs> I, think, I think it was meant to be an insult, but I'm like, fucking cool. I'm down with that. But anyway, sorry, go go ahead. Um, but I mean, the point I'm tra- I was trying to make there was uh, just searching for Phil Collins and Genesis music using LimeWire. Because, you know, I'll throw up my hands and say, you know, I've illegally downloaded music before. Um, it was it wasn't it was more convenient than going and buying a CD just to get one song, um, but it wasn't more convenient than iTunes where I can just type in Phil Collins and get all his solo stuff. Click a button, ninety nine cents. That song's mine, and I'm happy to pay for that, even though I know I could get it for free with a little more effort. It's like I could mow my own lawn, but I am fat and lazy, so we'll pay a gardener to come and do it. Uh, right. People will pay for convenience, and that's my problem with online passes is, okay, it isn't a big deal uh, to use a controller and type in a 25-digit code, but it's still an inconvenience, and yeah, in a yeah. world of instant streaming where you can get movies where whenever you want, you can type in Nelly Furtado in iTunes and get Nelly Furtado straight away, even the smallest of inconvenience is not what you want to be doing. You need to be going the other way because the game industry is lagging behind in that. It's so behind when you've got mandatory installs and firmware updates and patches and online passes and DLC passes and pre-order bonuses. All this shit and tat between the gamer and the game. Whereas in the movie industry now, we've got Netflix where you just get direct access. We've got YouTube direct streaming. You've got iTunes direct music. The entertainment media is constantly well the most successful entertainment mediums are closing the gap between the game uh, right. the- okay. but but a few things on that I, I agree I, I but three quick things on that one is I, I think it's interesting though uh, that you're right there's a lot of inconvenience that you can kind of aim your your, your sniper rifle at when it comes to playing a, a retail sort of box copy video game it strikes me as odd that out of all the things that you're choosing to champion or you're choosing to sort of go up against, it's one of the least of the inconveniences I would put entering a code to get your online probably way down on the list compared to constant updates or even, you know, look, we're doing patches. I fucking hate them. But, you know, patches or, uh, you know, uh, uh, prices, there's a lot of a lot more things that are inconvenient to the gamer than the online pass. So that makes me go. It can't just be the, the convenience issue that really has got you on a tear about this. It's more to, it's more the fact that because, you know, I, I have on separate occasions railed against updates and patches and, and, and other forms of DLC that gets in the way. Don't get me wrong. I do not think they're better. Uh, and in many ways, they are worse. But the point is, is the online pass thing was just 
just an unnecessary addition back onto that. It's more like the straw that broke the camel's back rather than everything else that's putting pressure on the camel's back, you know? It was just this this final thing that's like, really? Shit's already bad and you just want to throw just that little extra sprinkle of shit on top of the shit cake? It's like, yeah, really? But, well, now, here's what I'll tell you about what I was going to say, though. Is, so you're talking about the other entertainment medium. Change comes for two reasons. Change comes because it you, you were forced to change. And this is, you know, I don't want to, I was going to say, I don't want to get all Oprah, but why not? I like Oprah, you know, she's a smart lady. So it, it comes for two reasons though. It comes because, and this is in, in business or this is in life, you know, you either get fit and lose weight because you, you have the heart attack and thank God you survive it. And you're like, okay, shit, this shit's real. Um, or, and, and that's most people. Okay. So I'll give you an example. I got into a, it was really fun. I'm not mad at the guy. He and I both said, wow, this is one of the best discussions I had at Dice. But I got into a discussion because I'm talking to a lot of people in the free-to-play space because there's a lot of stuff I don't like about it. And I'm like, can my business model that I want to partner with people to create, can that actually work in your industry? And so many of those guys I talk to are all about just the money. Well, this doesn't monetize well. It's like, what? why are you doing this? Is, is the, I was telling him, I said, well, you know, this budget might be $4 million and we might make profit. You know, he's like, but your game's only going to run for two years if you don't do this kind of thing that I thought was pretty evil that maintains maintains retention um, or maintains re it, it creates retention. And I said, I said, yeah, but two years, you know, we'd probably end up with like $30 million in profit. He's like, yeah, but if you do this, you could have a lot more. I'm like, dude, why are you doing it? If the only reason you're doing it is to make a lot of money, then you're evil and, or you're not evil. You're just soulless. I I'd rather, I'd rather put a great product into the world that makes a lot of people happy. And yeah, we made a profit. We all got to, you know, have nice bonuses and, and treat our families well and ourselves well. But we, the bigger thing is we put something out there that made people really happy. And that's the other reason you change, right? You either change because you have to, which these, some of these free to play guys are going to change because ultimately the consumer is going to catch on and go, this experience is shit compared to hopefully what Jaffe and his new crew are going to give and other people like the League of Legends guys or whatever. Um, or you change because like, you know, you genuinely have a vision and a desire to put something good into the world and you make decisions not because you have to, but because you, well, you actually, you do have to because you're spiritually compelled to make those changes. Not, you're not business wise. And in fact, a lot of times they go against what the, the, the standard quote unquote good business thinking is, but you do it for that reason. And so when it comes to when you're saying games are behind other entertainment mediums, I think a lot of it is because they, most of the people in the industry are just like normal people. Most people only change if they have to. Right. They don't change because they want to, because they're driven and they're compelled. It's like it's a job. They love it. They have a good time. But ultimately, you know what? This is kind of what the business is. And oh, shit, we're losing money. Let's do this. And I, I, you know, that's that's, you know, I'm not a fan of living life that way, at least when it comes to my creative work. I wish I could apply the same to the way I take care of my body because I'm overweight, you know, but I haven't had. I hope I don't have to have the heart attack that I survive in order to learn. Dude, you got to fucking eat better. But when it comes to the way I do my work, I'm always going, I want to give the best consumer experience ever because I think that is ultimately the best business. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm planning my heart attack for about 38, 40. I think that's a good time for me to have my heart attack and then well, I'll lose some weight. So I've been able to hang out in the 30s and go, wow, you're too young for a heart attack. But well, now I'm 40. So it could happen. So I, I got I, I to gotta make the change on my own because uh, I really don't want to be have it made for me, you know? But it's hard. It's really yeah. hard. But I think that's my, my my whole thing is the online pass to me just looks like it's just another out you know, I'll beat the newest example of what's gonna lead some of these companies to have to have their own personal heart attack or you know, the industry equivalent of heart attack. Uh, because they've seen a problem and the way they fight it is to inconvenience consumers, which as far as I can tell just has a track record of not working. It's, I mean, okay, it's a little inconvenience to go into Best Buy and have that same fucking prick come up to me and my wife and say, hey, how much are you paying for your table satellite TV at the moment? Well, I've got Direct TV over here. I mean, that's a little inconvenience to just tell him every time, look, dude, I'm not interested, but I don't go into Best Buy anymore because I don't want that when I'm shopping. Uh, and for the same reason, I don't want to deal with bullshit when I'm playing a console game, especially when consoles were set up to be the anti-PC, to be convenient. Whereas nowadays, consoles are just looking like shit PCs. I mean, if I'm going to put up with hassle, I'm just going to stick to 
the PC because at least I'm going to get better graphics and I can mod my games. No, um, that's, a, that's a really good. That's a really really good point though. In terms of yeah, I mean these days, you know yeah, I mean I I I think. I think ultimately we're 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 not going to see consoles in in ten years anyway, and I don't and, and probably sooner. I think ultimately Sony's going to be in the content business like they are with movies, just like Microsoft is going to be. I mean, they might be making the hardware that drives uh, whether it's an online service or, or or but but ultimately I and I don't mean browser based like the stuff I'm thinking about. I'm not trying to pitch browser, but ultimately it's going to be uh, a real time experience pumped into your into your smart TV. And the the concept of owning a console versus just like yeah the graphics get better because the people who actually are pumping this in th- they have amazing hardware, um, but I I think yeah I think that's that's going to go away anyway. I mean again that's why I'm thinking you know to debate this is interesting, but this is such a th- this is such a, uh, a transient uh, issue, I, and there's a much bigger issue underneath it which has to do with treating the consumer well, price points, what is the actual value of a game, um, and, and, and how much uh, of, of what we have assumed is a good game in the past because of our limited options uh, is going to dramatically shift. And that's why, look, I wasn't making a statement. When I voted for Angry Birds as one of the games of, of, of a year, the year two years ago when I was, on, when I was doing the DICE uh, Awards, uh, and a lot of people gave me shit, but it's like, no, that game was as good to me and for a lot of people as a lot of the $60 games in terms of the entertainment value I got out of it. And I think that those are the real to me, not that I don't, I don't think this debate is, is interesting and relevant, but it's such a small little blink of an eye in terms of the timeline of video games. And the bigger questions I think are, are substantially more important because the people who answer those questions well uh, are, are going to dominate the industry. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is, as you say, a transient issue, but I think what online passes and, and, and the way of combating used sales and even piracy uh, does, it, it's, a, it's reflective of a more long-term issue of publisher attitudes and, as you say, treating the consumer well. There are a lot of old attitudes as to how you do business that are going to have to change when we eventually go into a predominantly digital industry because you can't do some of the things the way they've been done. Um once you start being able to sell a game digitally, people are going to like ask, like they're starting to ask EA, why am I still paying sixty dollars for this? Uh, that's going to have to change, and I think the but, iTunes. Yeah, even, even yes, you're right. But even think about that from it, right? So you know the answer, right? The answer is well, if you know, and I, I've been really excited, even though it's not enough in my opinion, where Sony's selling Vita games on the Vita digitally, which is how I like to buy them. I don't want to go into a store and buy a Vita game if I can get it digitally, because um, I don't want to have to carry around a fucking little uh, card, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but. But I mean that, that there, your answer kind of proves the fact. I think that the publishers aren't. They may be greedy, but I don't think they're greedy the way you think they are. Because the reason that they can't sell those games, the reason you can't go buy Twisted Metal online, it's not, it doesn't exist yet, but I'm sure it will relatively soon. But you can't buy it on PSN or whatever it's called now uh, for twenty nine dollars, because or or forty nine, or even ten percent, ten dollars less is you know why. It's because they don't want to run the risk of pissing off the retailer. So again, if they're basically launching an incredibly expensive piece of hardware, there's a lot riding, I would imagine, on the success of the Vita. They're spending a lot of money to market it. They want this to succeed. If they're only able to cut the consumer who buys digitally a couple of bucks off the retail price, then I think maybe there's at least a hint or a clue there about rethinking this position that the the, 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 the game publishers are greedy and we don't give a fuck about pissing off GameStop. Clearly, if we, if, if we give that much of a fuck that, that, that Sony is willing to piss them off a little bit for a machine, but not much for a machine that they have a lot riding on, that's, a, that's an important relationship to them. You have to assume that the online pass thing is definitely something that, that, that they didn't do and not care about, but it was a desperate act probably in terms of their feeling they're losing a lot of money. I'm not going to give EA or, or, or THQ or whatever the, the benefit of the doubt and just 
assume they do what they do because they're afraid of upsetting GameStop. If only with things I've seen where GameStop's not part of the equation. I mean, if you look at EA's offerings on iTunes, um, for example, they brought Theme Park back and everyone was very excited until they realised that they're using Theme Park to sell Theme Park rides as DLC, just single rides for $60 a pop. Um, and that's like just oh, single yeah. theme park that's, rides. That's in, like I, I I've been doing research into the free to play market, and I I don't understand it like the cost. And I I need to I this is you know this is why I'm learning about this market because I I might want to get into it in some way. But if the only way to make money in that space, like I was playing Battlefield Heroes, which I liked, and I was looking at Battlefield uh, just the Battlefield free to play, and the cost of some of these virtual I don't believe in selling virtual items anyway. But regardless, the cost, it's like, it's what? Are you insane? Why would you charge that much? Who would pay that much? Yeah. So and there's, think, yeah, it's crazy. And I don't think that is the only way to make money. I think that points to the greed aspect. And that's why I'm not going to just trust that the only reason we're buying $60 games on Origin is because EA is scared of GameStop. Okay, well, yeah, I'm not, I don't know about EA. I'm just, I'm just, and, and, and I'm not saying you're wrong about any or all of these publishers. I'm just saying that that at least I think anybody listening to this and maybe even you should, you know, make a little space in your mind for the fact that this argument, cause I see it a lot online. Oh, you're just a bunch of fucking greedy. You know, you guys, again, people think we're all super rich and driving fucking Ferraris and shit. Um, and it's like, you, you guys, how many more mansions do you need? It's, it's that kind of, you know, how many more boats can you ski behind Gordon Gecko thing? And all I'm saying is make a little space to look at the Vita situation. I mean, why in the world, are they only cutting off a couple of dollars? Why, why before the Vita, you know, on the PSP, it was the exact same price. You know, it's, it, it's, there's, there's gotta, you gotta, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a message being sent there. Right. Which is like, I think Sony would probably like to sell their digital copies for less money if they could, but it would, it would alienate the retail partner, which means the retail partner is important. And if they've done something like online passes, you have to assume that to do something that would alienate that retail partner like that means they were in a pretty desperate situation. I'm not saying that's true if in your mind, but I think it's important to at least entertain it because that's a pretty de that's a pretty bold yeah. move. To, it's a to thought to be entertained, sure. I mean, yeah. I, it's certainly something to consider. Um, but again, I mean, looking at Sony, I, I'm not again. I'm not sure. I I totally believe that they would like to sell things cheaper than they do um, because this is a company that said oh we can charge what was it like 300 odd dollars for the PSP Go and when asked why they literally said because we can that was their reason for doing it because we can do you okay let me add do you think that was a a guy caught in the headline uh, headlights of a question with just some bravado or do you genuinely think they were sharing the philosophy of why they priced it at that point I mean no I've never sat in a meeting and somebody yeah look if somebody says can we sell twisted metal for sixty dollars uh well we could uh, yeah well that answer is true because we can and until we can't and then we'll drop the price but i mean do you really think that that was that was the reason just you know i mean the it's, arrogance the it's arrogance the only the reason they've given us <laughs> you know i can only operate on what what i've been told and that was the message that was put out there I mean, if they would have if they would have phrased it a little bit better, and you know, here's the pot calling the kettle black, right? But if they would have phrased it a little better and said, well, because you know, we've done research, we've shown people this, and this is what we think the product is worth, that's the same way of that's the nice way of saying because we can sell it for that. Now it turned out they were wrong, and I actually enjoyed the PSP, but I enjoyed it a lot because I like the feel of it, I like the size of it, and I fucking hate carrying around media. But clearly, it, it that 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 was that was I was in the minority on that because it, it didn't sell well at all. Yeah, I mean, well, the PSP itself did well. It was more the PSP Go that. That's right. That's what that's right. I thought you were yeah. about the Go. Yeah, that's what yeah. I meant. Um, but I mean, it's I'm not again. I'm not indicting anyone when I say that. I'm not saying, oh, look at them being arrogant. I'm more saying they will charge what they think they can get away with, whether GameStop's a factor or not. So I'm. I'm less willing to believe that GameStop is the sole reason why they charge so much for digital copies, because I think whether GameStop was a factor or not, they'd still charge as much as they could get away with, as yeah. is their inalienable right. Right, but but I totally agree with that, but that's anything. But, I mean, don't you don't you think... Um, I mean, again, Steam proves it. If, 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 if Rayman came out on the Vita, let's assume the Vita has a huge penetration, and I, I hope it does. And look, I, I like... I, I, I've... I, I, I've... My... 
it's a different conversation, but I'm, I'm much more pro on both the 3DS and the Vita than I was before I played the Vita. Because for me, I was like, dude, I'm fine with my phone. And I am fine with my phone, but it wasn't until I started going, you know what, though? I really can't get these experiences on my phone, and I miss having these experiences while I'm sitting on the toilet, frankly. Um, you know, but regardless, though, let's assume it's, it has nice market penetration. I, I, you know, I think if, if Rayman if Rayman was $9.99, and I know that game's – I love that fucking game, man. But if it was $9.99, they would sell so many more copies of that game um, than they would if it's $35. And maybe they're like, well, yeah, we'll eventually get to $9.99, but we're going to sell as many as we can for $35. But, I mean, I, I definitely think that's always the balance you're having to kind of figure out where the sweet spot is on, on any given day, you know, of, 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 what your, of what your product is worth at any given time. But if they didn't have to take into account also the kind of the retail aspect of it, I definitely do think the prices would come down because consumers would say, well, fuck you. It's kind of like digital comics, right? I love digital comics. I will not – my buddy Paul Jenkins um, – who writes, he's writing Batman, Dead Man. I love his Dead Man series. He's running for DC right now. I told him to his face last week when I talked to him on the phone. I said, dude, I can't wait for the next issue. He's like, well, it's out. It came out today. I'm like, dude, not now. It's fucking $2.99. I'm not spending $2.99 on a fucking digital comic. The minute it drops to $1.99 is, 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 is when I'll buy it. Um, that's my phone. Hang on, let me just turn it off. Um, and so I think, um, you know, ultimately, you know, they're doing that because they're still trying to appease the, the retailer, you know, the brick and mortar retailer. So I definitely think, though, that they would sell more comics if they drop the price and we'll sell more games. So um, but if you take into account the, uh, the the GameStop issue as well, I think it's just another variable in the choice of what a product costs that, you know, it would be nice if if I wouldn't even say it would be nice if it went away. I'll miss the days when you can't go into a, I'm going to my GameStop tonight at six. Uh, to, to meet fans of Twisted Metal and sign copies of the game and stuff like that. I'll miss those days. But, you know, um, ultimately, I think it's going to be better when we go digital. And you're right, though. You know what? It's going to be the companies that, that read what the consumer really want. And here, the real DNA of this, this debate and discussion we're having, I think, is really the people who can, who can suss that out and really understand why the consumer is unhappy. And it's not the practical. It's not, ju it's not about the online pass. Yeah, it's about the fact that they are being disrespected enough in your mind to be inconvenienced with an online pass or in my mind uh, with a price point that is equivalent to retail or, or the games aren't worth that anyway. That's the real message. And the people who hear that are going to dominate the industry. So yeah. Yeah. I totally agree with that. I mean, that's the thing. The, the biggest problem the online pass has is, is it just speaks of an attitude that publishers have of, you know, get what we're owed at any cost, no matter what we do on the consumer end. And that is an attitude that needs to change us. I mean, digital distribution isn't even the predominant method of getting games yet, but we're already seeing shifts. You know, this is an industry now where someone like Notch can make Minecraft and become a multi-millionaire, where Tim Schafer can go on Kickstarter and say, oh, hey, I need a couple of thousand dollars. And then gamers say, here, have a million. You know, it's, it's right. very exciting and awesome. And I think a lot of these publishers are going to have to realize that that's the result of love and trust and gamers that love their game makers. And that's not the relationship that gamers have with the John Riccatellos, with the Bobby Kotick's of the world. Let me, let me add, I, I have to run and I'm sure you do too, but I, I want to, I want to, I want to ask you one final question on that because I'm curious about that. So, uh, so yes, Schaefer has been an amazing success story. Notch as well. Do you, th cause I, now I look at those guys. I think that game company would probably be real successful on Kickstarter because they make unique products that speak to a certain audience that's passionate about them. And I think that's wonderful. Do you think, though, if the, um, you know, if the guys uh, who make Modern Warfare or Battlefield or Uncharted, probably Uncharted, yes, but any of the games that are, you know, and I wouldn't, I, look, I, I think Modern Warfare has, has revolutionized aspects of the industry, and I consider myself a fan, so I'm not knocking it. But I definitely think if you're talking about a, a product that lacks kind of a soul compared to a game like something Schaefer makes or Notch makes, I definitely think you could say Modern Warfare probably lacks a soul or at least has a substantially less strong heartbeat. Do you think that something like Kickstarter would work for those teams? Certainly they wouldn't be able to make enough to fund a new Modern Warfare, but do you think the reason do you think that they uh, create the same kind of emotional connection and loyalty that a Schaefer game has that would see people giving 
almost $2 million in less than a week or two weeks um, to them? Or do you think because they maybe lack those things that they wouldn't have that level of success? I think, it, I mean, the modern warfare is such a, a hard one because I, contrary to what people believe, I do think a lot of love goes into them. I, I, I actually play... I, I believe that they're amazingly executed games. I'm not knocking them. Um, but I actually play Modern Warfare almost uh, predominantly for the campaign, which people find weird. Uh, but I, I, they're beautifully scripted campaigns with uh, surprisingly interesting stories. But more to the point, I, I don't know whether they'd have that success because they don't have that connection with fans or just because people know they've got the money, you know? like It, right. it would seem a bit rich for... A, a, an Activision or EA CEO to come to gamers cap in hand and say, I can't afford to do this. Yeah, um, no, although I, I don't doubt they're going to try and do it. Like I wouldn't be surprised if Ubisoft tried to set up a Kickstarter for something like beyond good and evil Two, or, yeah. or one of those games they don't want to fund. Um, and we'll have to see what they do there because I, I think, I think Ubisoft could make uh, a million or two on Kickstarter to get I, I wonder, good evil. I wonder how those big companies and corporations like that are going to have to deal with the tax issues, though, because I can't imagine. I and I, I trust me, I ain't smart. I'm not sitting here like I know about tax law. I don't. <laughs> I'm just I'm just kind of wondering, you know, because uh, you know, Double Fine's a small company. They have under a certain number of employees. You start getting into Activision raising two million dollars off the backs of Kickstarter. You know, and I know Double Fine has to pay taxes on those on the, that money, but the amount that Activision would have to raise, I, I wonder if it would even yeah, be worth yeah. it. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it's, it, it is a cool time, though, and, it, and it's a time that I do think it's, it's forcing developers. Um, you know, look, I was talking to somebody at DICE. I said, look, Genova uh, Chen at that game company, to me, it's like, I'd love, you talk about the campaign in Modern Warfare, I'm, I would love for someone with his sensibilities to direct a campaign of Modern Warfare. I'd still want it to be an action game, you know, but it's like, to me, it's like the, the, these big games in the campaigns have become so much special effects showreels and they, they, they don't have the heart that these smaller indie games have, but the smaller indie games don't have the same kind of mainstream sensibilities, you know, and I, I would just love to see that come together in some way uh, where you get a wonderfully fun action war game uh, campaign, but it, it's, it's got a lot more heart and soul. So when you're done playing it, you know, it's not like disposable with the one that comes out next year that has better effects, but you really remember it and it resonates on an emotional level. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. And I think people are wrong when they just focus on Kickstarter as if the message to take away is Kickstarter is the new way to make money. Uh, the message that the Kickstarter thing sends to me is anything's possible now. And not just Kickstarter, but there are new ways to make money, there are new ways to make games, new ways to put those games out there. And that's the developers that work out those new ways, because I'm sure there are some hidden away that just need to be mined out of the internet. There are ways of making games and producing, funding, distributing games that we haven't even thought of yet and can't even think of them yet. But those studios that do are the ones that are going to succeed. And those companies that still stick with old school mentalities of this is the way games are made, this is how much we charge for them. I think they're going to drown in a, in a sort of tide of change that's coming and, and yeah, is I with us right now. No, I think you're going to have, you're always going to have the handful of, of big, big money games. But, you know, you saw it this year's E3. There's less and less and less and less of them. And you saw it at PAX this year when we were, when I, I, I don't think you were at PAX, but I was at PAX and I was walking around. I was, I was stunned by the number of medium range games that have come back into the market now and, 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 and independent games. So I, I, I agree. And I think that's going to force us as developers to, you know, step up our game when it comes to really understanding the interactive medium and not just doing it in an arty farty way. That's why I think Notch has been so successful because he made something inexpensive. It didn't rely on the world's most beautiful graphics or production value, but it understood what people like about interactivity. Um, and it, it is kind of one of the few indie products I can point to that is, is uh, that really is kind of like what I was talking about. It's like the HBO or the, the, the AMC uh, in terms of like Breaking Bad or whatnot, or Mad Men, sorry, of television for video games where it's like, it's still mainstream enough to be commercial. It's not so indie that it's just like the path or something. It's, it's literally, it's a good entertaining product, but it's also, it's also playing to the strength of the medium without having to rely on a lot of this surface stuff that, you know, the big new technology mm -hmm. that I think is, is distracting. And I, again, if the last thing I'll say, I really got to go, I love talking to you about this stuff, but um, is the last thing I'll say is, 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 um, 
I really wish reviewers, I've been saying this for years, would, would really kind of applaud the production value of games and they would they would give props to the technical people on the team and the amazing artisan or art, artists we have on the team. And th those people need to be applauded. And for people who buy games for the spectacle, they need to know, hey, this is one of those games, you're gonna love it. But I really wish that they would be they would learn to differentiate that from the actual product because every year you have so many games that get so well reviewed that are based mostly on the production value and not on the actual interactive experience and i think it's bad for the medium that is, that's why i love skyrim so much because people were able to it's not a very pretty game compared to something like uncharted it just isn't i mean maybe if you play it on the on a a, a great P pc but playing it on my ps3 it's not that pretty um, but boy, is it a great fucking game that really understands the interactive medium. And it was great to see the press get that and applaud yeah. that. And I think that. that's changing. I think like everything else in this industry, that also is improving. We've got games like Amnesia, The Dark Descent, that oh, that's fucking great. It looks, looks kind of crummy, but people loved it and it was critically acclaimed. And, and Valve, of course, are always the amount of mileage they've gotten out of the source engine and still been critically well received is amazing. So we're heading that way. I think eventually this industry is heading to something good, but just right now it's 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 a, a sleazy and as you said earlier, it's a it's a it's a volatile, hostile time that yes. I hope we get out of soon. I agree. I agree. And we'll get there. So well listen, I'm gonna run. It sounds like we have our matchmaking network issues solved, so I wanna go let the tweet audience who's been waiting for me to give them an update know. But I wanna thank you for the conversation. It's been fun, dude. No, no, thank you for coming on, and, and you know, best of luck with Twisted Metal. It is a, a very fine game, and uh, glad the matchmaking issues are solved. I so. know. Well, thank you for that, and I will, uh, if we don't talk uh, again until I will either see you at GDC or E3 or Comic-Con or one of those crazy places. We shall indeed. Uh, thank you very much for coming on, David. You got it.